Welcome to the Electric Wire podcast. We bring you news and views on the most pressing issues facing Wisconsin's electric industry from policymakers, executives, and customer and environmental advocates. Bringing you these discussions, we are the Customers First Coalition. Here's your host, Executive Director Kristen Jilks. All right, welcome back to the Electric Wire. This is part two of our rebroadcast of our April 13th Power Breakfast event held in Madison, Wisconsin on the role of nuclear energy in Wisconsin's energy generation mix. I want to begin part two of this episode by saying again, a quick thank you to our event sponsors, Fredrickson and Byron Law Firm, Nuclear Energy Institute, the Wisconsin Counties Association, New Scale Power, Stafford and Rosenbaum, Michael Best, Wisconsin Utilities Association, ATC, and the Natural Resource Development Association. Thank you, sponsors, and thank you to all of our speakers. In this industry roundtable discussion, you will be hearing from Ellen Nowak, who is a former commissioner at the Public Service Commission of Wisconsin. She serves as a moderator. Tom Content is the executive director of the Citizens Utility Board of Wisconsin. Paul Wilson is the chair of the UW-Madison Department of Engineering Physics. Emily Pritzko is the executive director of the Wisconsin Building Trades Council. And Jeremy Browning is the vice president of Generation and Power Supply at Dairyland Power Cooperative. So thank you again to all of our speakers on the industry roundtable. A reminder that this is part two of the Power Breakfast, part one is immediately preceding this podcast episode in the Electric Wire episodes list. You can find more great speakers that kicked off our discussion on that episode. And thank you again to Wisconsin Eye for providing the audio for this episode. Head over to Wisconsin Eye at wiseye.org to find the video of the Power Breakfast. Thanks again, everybody. We're looking forward to this industry panel that we've got some fantastic thought leaders uh, in the industry, and uh, we are going to have a fantastic discussion here. And I am pleased to bring up our esteemed moderator, former commissioner at the Public uh, Service Commission of Wisconsin, Ellen Nowak, who will briefly introduce our panelists. And just want to say, uh, in the short time I've been in this uh, in the industry with Darylin, have really respected Ellen's comments, her thoughts, and just her support of customers first, her availability uh, in the industry, and just want to thank you very much for your service on the Public Commission, Public Service Commission and wish you many happy years in the next chapter. So, Ellen Nowak. Okay, good morning. I'm still here. It's good to see all of you. Good to see a lot of familiar faces this morning. Um, what a great discussion. Uh, first of all, I, I was commenting earlier, this is like, um, so in the past, I haven't done always a ton of research before I do some panels because I've kind of done this once or twice, but I've never done one on nuclear and because we've never really talked about this here. So this is a first of its kind. So uh, to Kristen and to customers first and your board for um, having this discussion here today. Thank you. Um, I hope this is the first of many to come. And because uh, we have a lot to learn and I think a lot to educate ourselves. And then we have to, in turn, then go out and educate the public as well. And you heard about, um, you know, we did have a moratorium um, in place for quite a long time. Um, thanks to Representative Peterson, of course, for his efforts to get that lifted. But I, I would be remiss if I also didn't mention that way back in 2001, there was a guy named Representative Mike Hipsch, who some of you might know who first started, he was been a, he's been a warrior and a champion for nuclear for many, many years. And he first started that fight and introduced that bill back in 2001 and continued to fight for nuclear while he was at the, um, in the legislature and then, of course, came onto the commission. So it's been a long battle. It was well worth it. And it, it's part of the reason why we're standing here today to continue to talk about where it's going to go in the state. Some of the materials you provide have been provided show that about 16% of a, 16 or so percent of Wisconsin's electricity comes from nuclear, and I hope that we're going to continue to see that rise throughout the year, um, particularly because it's that carbon-free 
um, attributes. And as I was doing some more research on it, you know, you look at the attributes of of nuclear. It's carbon free. It's dispatchable. It's reliable. It's fuel secure. It's resilient. It's energy dense. It's basically cost stable. It's like, wow, let's bring more of that. <laughs> like, love, 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 love all of those things. So um, let's let's do some more of that. So we've got a great panel to talk about how we're going to get there. Um, let's get rid of the drought in Wisconsin on, on nuclear. We've had a drought in the U.S. There, you know, there was a period of 20 years where there wasn't even one built in the entire United States, which is a little crazy to think about. Um, the first most recent one came in 2016 when the TVA um, had their nuclear plant um, built. And, of course, uh, we heard Plant Vogel down in Georgia, where I was just down there uh, last week and saw some folks from Southern Company, and they were very excited about steam coming out of the Plant 3 down there for the first time. Um, it's a little behind schedule and over budget, but we will not talk about that part. Uh, but they were really excited because that is finally starting to come online, and I think the... Um, the, uh, the it's finally going to pay off for them and all of the rate payers down there. So our panel today, you're not here to listen to me, our panel today, Paul Wilson, he's the chair of UW-Madison Department of Engineering Physics. We have Jeremy Browning, he's the vice president of Generation and Power Supply from Dairyland Power Cooperative. We have Emily Pritzkow, the executive director of Wisconsin Building Trades Council, and then Tom Content the executive director of the Citizens Utility Board. So we're going to go through real quick. I want them just to introduce themselves, their role at their respective organizations, and then we're going to come back through again and have a deeper dive into the discussion about um, their perspective on nuclear and where they sit. So we'll start with you, Paul. Uh, my name is Paul Wilson. I'm the chair of the engineering physics department, uh, professor of nuclear engineering. I've been here for just over 20 years doing research in, in nuclear energy topics, both fission and fusion. Um, I'm really you know, thankful to Customers First Coalition for holding this event today. I get a lot of prodding from people, including some in the audience, to hold more things on nuclear. And the way we convene things at university, we often don't get an opportunity to, to engage the diversity of, of the audience here. And so I think that um, Customers First has really been able to bring together a group of people that, that's really great to have this conversation. Um, you know, we, we have a great program here, a, a nation-leading program in both fission and fusion. Um, we've got uh, six or 12 students here in the audience, if you want to meet some of them, um, and uh, uh, look forward to this conversation. Hey, good, good morning. Um, my role with Dairyland Power is uh, basically the oversight of the generating assets that Dairyland currently has. And I'll pause for a moment and uh, let you know that I'm not from the state of Wisconsin. I don't know if that's coming through the mic, but uh, it's a privilege to have the opportunity to be here uh, we have about 1,300 megawatts of generation energy, and that's divided into thirds. A third of that comes from coal, a third of that comes from natural gas, and a third of that comes from hydro, wind, and solar. So it's a little diverse mix, but uh, the future of what our customers and what our owners expect in the future is really another part of my job, and that is pursuing small modular reactor technology as the future for the energy source that's going to displace some of our carbon generating assets. So that's really a, another part of my portfolio. So my background, uh, very similar, but uh, probably not as intellectually uh, strong as uh, Representative Peterson. I did come out of the Na uh, high school in 1984, joined the Navy, Naval Nuclear Power Program. Um, I did not go into the electronic side. I, I was more of the mechanical side. I, I did operate the facilities, but my first role was working in the naval shipyards up in Groton, Connecticut, doing new construction on a fast attack submarine, which I'm a plank owner of. So I was able to actually see and witness the quality and the construction of what a power plant really looks like at a very young age, really appreciated quality and safety being a key factor. And I say that from a perspective of, I lived in a building called the uh, Thresher Hall. And for those of you that are not familiar with uh, the nuclear Navy, the Thresher was one of the, uh, Cold War casualties, we lost that nuclear power submarine and 90 souls went with it. So every day when you would walk through that building, it, it really reinforced the importance of what safety and reliability was all about, because I did end up spending four years on that power, uh, nuclear powered submarine, traveling across the globe in the Cold War environment. I left in the U.S. Navy and uh, joined the commercial nuclear power business, primarily working for large investor-owned utilities. 
I licensed as a reactor operator, senior reactor operator. I held a position as a plant manager of a Grand Gulf nuclear facility in Port Gibson, Mississippi, and a role as a vice president providing oversight of two pressurized water reactors in the state of Arkansas. I spent the five years preceding my uh, time here with Dairyland doing major mods, maintenance, and construction in uh, commercial nuclear power plants from New Hampshire to California. And there's probably not a commercial plant in the United States that I have not been a part of some form of maintenance or construction. Um, hopefully through this conversation, you'll understand why I'm actually in, in Wisconsin and, and my role in supporting small modular reactor technology in the state. All right. Hello. Uh, my name is Emily Pritzko. I'm the executive director of the Wisconsin Building Trades Council. We're a relatively new organization founded in 2018. We have about 17 member unions, um, craft trades across the state. Uh, their membership adds up to about 40,000 working Wisconsinites. Uh, and uh, we joined together recently, even though our, our membership itself, most of the unions are about 130 years old in the state. So it's, I am really excited to be with this organization. Um, I'm excited to be part of something that's growing and that can be built up. And I think it's great that all of our uh, member crafts are getting on the same page and working together to advocate for issues like this that um, we all get behind and, and want to promote. Uh, myself, I came from the legislature. So most recently was chief of staff to Gordon Hintz, who was the Democratic leader in the assembly. I spent my last few years in the legislature uh, working for him and was with him about 11 years total. Uh, very happy to be here today and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Hi, everyone. Tom Content. I'm executive director at the Citizens Utility Board of Wisconsin. CUB is the nonprofit, independent, and nonpartisan consumer advocate for the ratepayers of the state of Wisconsin and for the residential and the small business customers of Wisconsin's utilities. Um, and with appreciation to the legislators in the room and those in caucus, uh, we are the statutory consumer advocate. Um, and we are also growing. We, have, we now have a team of six. We have experienced economists and policy analysts that dive into PSC utility proposals at the PSC to determine uh, when they're proposed, what, whether projects are needed, whether they're cost effective. I'm looking forward to this discussion. I was thinking about the same thing. I, I've been on panels. I hadn't been on a nuclear panel before, but I do remember meeting Mike Hipsch in his uh, legislative office about 20 years ago when I was writing for the Journal Sentinel, and I wrote various stories over the years about the nuclear renaissance is, is about to start or something, or the moratorium is still being debated, or et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it's, this issue's been... So I, I come to this issue... Uh, with a lot of questions still, because that's my background in reporting, and that's the, that's kind of the, the the what Cub brings to asking tough questions about these issues. Great, thank you all. Um, great background here. So now let's stick with you and walk back this way. Just a little bit more on why is why is Cub getting interested now in nuclear, and what role do you see your organization? Play? Sure. Well, my predecessors, um, the executive directors of CUB, had spoken out against repealing the moratorium. Um, and at the time that the last moratorium bill was, when it was actually a, a, a repealed, um, the cost the cost issue was 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 the economics is was critical. Um, and we were looking at the costs of the Vogel plant, which at the time was uh, estimated at the time of the repeal was estimated estimated to be about seventeen billion. Um, up from up about three billion uh, from the prior uh, from the original estimate, and now those costs have, have actually doubled. It's closer to thirty billion. Um, so we we come at it from a cost perspective. We're concerned about the costs um, going going forward, but we know we're in we're know we're in a in a new technological uh, a time of rapid technological change, and so as these as these technologies lift off. Um, or lift off toward commercialization. I think we need just have be looking at all the technologies that are out there, and so what Cub's perspective is going to try to um, see what how do they, these things stack up once they do become commercial. Emily, yeah, your your group's interest in nuclear and why now? Why why did you agree to come here? <laughs> I think 
our relationship um, with employers that are at nuclear power sites has been a longstanding one. So um, I myself uh, actually got to visit Point Beach in my previous position in the legislature. It was fantastic. I actually went there with Kara Penoyer, who I think has left, but she's at the PSC now. Um, it was an incredible experience to go and tour that facility. Um, and then when I interviewed for my job uh, with the state building trades, it was one of the first questions they actually asked me about. I think since I had a democratic background, they were a little curious about my position um, on the issue. And I had a lot to say um, based on that experience. Um, so it's, it's a big priority. It's a valuable relationship um, across all our trades. Uh, these facilities tend to employ every single one of our member trades. Uh, the building trades are synonymous with integrity, quality, getting things done on time and under budget. So it's a natural partnership for us to have. Um, and obviously for us, um, this is a huge source of highly skilled, um, well-paying jobs for our members. So um, right now, uh, renewables are really necessary and helpful in reducing emissions, which we have an interest in. We are working on a lot of solar projects and other renewable projects as well. Um, but with a few exceptions, those projects are not ready to fully fill base demands, which the other speakers kind of covered at length there, at least not on their own. Um, and we agree that uh, along with solar and wind, that nuclear power has uh, it offers a potential solution to kind of fill that full base load. Um, it was touched on a little as well by Cheryl, but we're also really interested in a just transition and how we can transition these coal fired and sometimes natural gas plants into nuclear power plants and retain those jobs here in the state. Um, and continue to feed into Wisconsin's economy. That's a huge priority for us. Almost all um, of the jobs at those plants can be converted, um, some directly and some with training. You know, there are some subtle differences between the work done on the coal plants and the nuclear plants, but the actual physical work of them is very similar. Um, so that's a really exciting concept for us. Um, and as a lot of people in this room know, uh, there's a lot of other infrastructure around those sites that might expedite the process of keeping them there, um, including water, including line siting, things like that. Um, so we, in general, are really supportive of looking at these advanced technologies that are clean. Um, we recognize that there's obviously still a spent waste issue that was already touched on a little that needs to be addressed. Um, but this seems like just such a logical transition for jobs, for reliability of our infrastructure, and then also for these communities, a lot of them which are rural communities that would, I'm sure, love to retain that tax base and those jobs. So I'll just recapture the, uh, the question, the interest in dairy land, the inter my, my interest, uh, obviously my interest personally, uh, Bachelor of Science in Nuclear Technology, Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, those are my personal interests, but that's irrelevant. The most important thing is that my interests have to be aligned with our key stakeholders, and those are the key stakeholders of Dairyland Power. Who are those key stakeholders? Those are the communities in which we work and serve. Those are the employees that have to have the commitment to do what we're asking them to do, whether it's present technology, future technology, making sure their interests. We are owned by 24 individual distribution co-ops. They have particular interests. And then, obviously, the ratepayers at the end of the day have an interest. And you ask yourself, fundamentally, what are those interests? There, there are three buckets. It's safety, reliability, and affordability and in, in the present and in the future. So when I talk about safety, I want to make sure I'm clear that I'm talking about industrial safety, environmental safety, radiological safety. And there's a component of reliability safety that sometimes goes overlooked. And if you look back a couple of years ago in the state of Texas, 270 souls lost their lives during an event that occurred due to severe weather and loss of electricity. If you can imagine what that would look like in the state of Wisconsin, Illinois, Minnesota, if a significant event occurred in the dead of winter and souls were lost, there'd be a lot of finger pointing, there'd be a lot of challenges that we would have to look in the mirror and reflect on. So my interests have to support those interests. So why Dairyland? Dairyland is very committed to those three core attributes in the present and in the future. And they do see a very viable 
option with the safe deliverable delivery of energy to um, to the customers through small modular reactor technology. So that's really one of the driving reasons as to why I left the world that I was living in and came to the state of Wisconsin, along with it's a beautiful state and the people are wonderful. Yes, go ahead. Right. Um, yeah. So, you know, why am I here? I, my wife would tell you I would not pass up any opportunity to talk about nuclear energy with anyone who would listen. So thank you for being a captive audience. Uh, maybe more important to sort of talk about why now? Um, I think we're at a real pivot point for nuclear energy. Um, we've heard a lot of talk about Vogel going on the grid in this month. You know, until April 1st, there was no nuclear power plant in the country that started construction after the 1970s that was providing electricity. Um, as of April 1st, that's no longer true. Um, but we learned a lot of lessons. I mean, I think, you know, uh, Alan said we weren't going to talk about that part, but I think we have to talk about the lessons we've learned from Vogel and, and how we can do that better. And one of the lessons, I think, is the pivot towards smaller reactor technologies. And in this country, at least, it seems like that's really where the, the opportunity is um, to really to make a shift <clears throat> in nuclear energy from building airports to building airplanes, right? Historically, our nuclear power plants have been large infrastructure projects you know, plagued with all the challenges that we face across the industri industrial sectors in the United States and other countries with large industrial projects. We want to look towards a world where small modular reactors are more like a lot more factory construction, a lot more control, a lot more opportunity to learn. Um, Cheryl talked about the order book, right? I think that order book is really important for getting that going. And one of the students in my class this semester is sort of looking to Boeing and seeing what kind of things can we learn from how Boeing builds new aircraft and an order book kind of questions just like that. And so this pivot towards smaller technologies has financial implications, very obviously, in terms of making it a smaller outlay for investor-owned utilities or even small communities and co-ops to be interested in getting into nuclear. But I think it also has a, it, it resets the equation on social license as well. Large um, central nuclear power plants have a different relationship with the consumers than possibly you could have with smaller nuclear power plants. And so I'm really interested in, in that kind of shift as well. And then finally, when you broaden the energy products beyond electricity, one of the advanced reactor development projects that, that Cheryl mentioned with X Energy was originally planned to be an electricity power plant in eastern Washington. And recently, through a, a relationship with Dow Chemical, they've moved that project to look at it being a project that's going to be deployed on one of Dow Chemical's chemical plants um, with alternative energy products there. That's close to my heart. My dad worked for Dow Chemical for 30 years in Western Canada. So uh, I get to call him and tell him about all the nuclear reactors that Dow's interested in now. So, so I think it's a really exciting time and it's a very new time. It's not your grandpa's nuclear power anymore. So. Paul, let's stick with you then. Um, so, yeah, we probably have seen the last large scale plant, right? Built, probably. Never say never. But, um, so what exactly, we keep hearing advanced nuclear, small nuclear, modular. Let's all make sure we are understanding those definitions and what it is. Can you um, explain the size and from a land perspective to the output? Because uh, it's still quite an energy dense. Right. I mean, so there was another statistic that I saw that the average solar facility requires 30 times the amount of land to generate the same amount of electricity as a nuclear plant. And I, I'm, I'm guessing they're thinking of a large scale one, but still, and then wind is 170 times more land. So obviously there's, you know, with a small nuclear, we're going to talk about a smaller footprint, but talk about the output too. And what does it mean by advanced nuclear? Sure. So we've got an hour and a half, right? So I'm okay. just kidding. Uh, um, there's no, a quiz so, too at uh, the end. Advanced, so advanced nuclear, when we talk about advanced nuclear and small reactors, there's sort of a couple of key components. Um, today's reactors are all based on uh, light water reactor technology, new scales technology, which is one of the first sort of small modular technologies to be certified and we expect to be built, is based on the same fundamental concept. So they're an evolutionary step into this advanced reactor capability. Generally, when we talk about advanced reactors, we talk about something that looks substantively different from today's reactors. Um, if you were to look at a picture of it, you would it would not look the same. Right? New scales reactors in many ways look the same. They're just smaller. And advanced reactors would have a lot of ways that they might look different from today's reactors, primarily in how we cool them, um, but other factors in how the fuel is made and things like that. So that's sort of the, the definition of advanced in a general sense. 
Um, more exciting maybe is this concept of small. Um, throughout my career up until recently, the whole idea was to build reactors bigger and bigger and bigger. And these two reactors that are being built in Vogel are some of the biggest reactors ever built in the United States. And the conventional wisdom was if you make them bigger, they're cheaper. And that's still true to a large extent, except that we've now grown to a size where the initial capital outlay is so large compared to what you know, utilities can afford. Um, and so now we've turned around and said, well, maybe it's not just the cost of electricity that matters. Maybe it's the cost of that investment that matters. And so small modular reactors bring us back down to be four or five times smaller in the amount of power. And there's a whole other class of reactors that are exciting called micro reactors, which are another maybe 10 times smaller than that. So small modular reactors, um, the key is that they're a little bit smaller. It means it's a smaller investment for a utility or a, or a cooperative like, like Darylin. It means that you can, you can make that small investment and build your first one and start generating revenue to help you build and pay for the next one. And you can build up maybe a, a, a facility that has a few of these reactors. It means that the individual components are of a scale that they can be built in a factory and shipped to the site. And so there's much less on-site work to be done and, and it's more of an assembly operation than a construction operation. Um, it has important imp in impacts for some of the job opportunities. It may mean that we want to be positioning Wisconsin to be a place where we have those factories, where the labor is shifting to that, that factory work and building these new technologies and sending around the rest of the country. Um, and so, so, you know, that sort of, I think, provides the main perspective. When we get down to micro reactors, we're talking about reactors that mostly fit in the size of a shipping container. And so the idea there for a lot of these companies is you would take a shipping container, you would deliver it, you would turn on the reactor and hook it up and you would run it for six or 10 years. And then you would turn it off and move it away and bring in another one. And it would be entirely different relationship with nuclear energy. Um, and it would be of a scale that we see community energy projects happening today community solar projects, community wind projects that are really driven by community demand. And so that's one of the places I'm interested in how reactors of that scale can really change the way the communities engage. Not to say they all should have nuclear power. I think we heard Cheryl's great description of how we need to, it needs to be possible people say no. But it, it means that communities can really think about this in, as part of a portfolio of other technologies they're considering, you know, as communities rather than as rate payers that are told what they what electricity they have to take coming down the grid. Jeremy, I don't know if you were there when it first the conversation first started at Dairyland, but can you walk us through maybe who was the first one to kind of raise the hand and say, should we start talking about nuclear? And how did that go? And how did the how did that reception take place? And then with your members, um, I'm this is I'm sure this has been in the making for quite a long time. And walk us through that evolution and how you're doing some of that outreach as well, I think, to, you know. Yes, certainly. To um, take away some of the fear, right? I think absolutely. because we just haven't talked about it. And uh, I, I appreciate the fact that we have some students in here and I'd love to have a conversation with you afterwards because um, my, my uh, creative juices are flowing, but I know that's not what the population wants to hear. We want to talk <laughs> about Dairyland's decision. Yes. And you're absolutely correct. I was not present when this, this conversation about nuclear energy at Dairyland uh, first started. It, it started in 1941. And uh, that was when Dairyland was formed. Dairyland was formed in 1941. At the same time, Pearl Harbor was being born or, or being bombed. And uh, there's a connection to the submarine that I was on, USS Helena. If you want to hear that story, I'll share it as well. 1940, Dairyland starts. 1960, Atomic Energy Commission is looking to build a facility and they're looking for a partnership company. Dairyland stepped up and they built this thing called LACBAR is the acronym. It's the La Crosse Boiling Water Reactor. So by mid-1970s, this facility was in service producing 50 megawatts of energy up and through the 80s. Uh, at that point, the affordability piece, it, it demonstrated to the Dairyland uh, team that it can be built safely, if operated efficiently, uh, can can produce power. There was no issues in those areas. However, the economics weren't there. So the, the facility was uh, decommissioned just recently, turned over back over to the site as a, a decommissioned site. So it actually started in 1940. Now, fast forward to the 2020s, some of the same generation, the pioneering spirit of being on the cutting edge and trying to figure out how to provide energy to the future is rebirthing itself through UAMPS, which is a 
a Utah uh, company that's very similar in nature, not exactly to Dairyland, but they're they're actually starting to work with um, um, New Scale. New Scale is going through some licensing. The board wanting to be pioneers, looking into the future, commitment to green energy, looking at the goals and how to achieve it in a safe, reliable, and affordable method, paying very close attention. They brought in a CEO in, in uh, it was the summer of 2020, uh, Brent Ridge, who has some nuclear experience and some executive experience and uh, kind of commissioned him with, we need to be able to manage what we have, but we also need the future to be mapped out. Uh, if you fast forward into October, UAMPS is actually signing, getting about $1.5 in federal funding to support the project. So they're starting to sense there could be something there. They charter Brent Ridge with really starting to put something together. He signs a memorandum of understanding for Dairyland with the uh, uh, New Scale and uh, started recruiting and hiring some people he thought could support him in those efforts. And he's since hired two executives, myself being one, which he's chartered with really seeing if we can explore that and uh, deploy it here in the state of Wisconsin. Great. Emily, um, we talked a bit. I mean, these the plants employ a lot more full time jobs than um, a lot of other types of generation. But you said some of the skills, most of the skills are transferable, uh, but there's still gotta be some training, some readiness, some willingness. So what is your group doing to, um, are you talking with universities, tech colleges, the industry to start to ready that? So we have a pipeline of workers that are ready, willing, and able. Yes, yeah, I mean, the. The trades have been discussing with our utility partners that the baseload needs cannot be fully met with renewables alone. Um, and we have certainly never had a problem fielding calls from our union halls for jobs on these types of sites. It's very popular, very in demand. Um, currently, we also already have a workforce that's nuclear trained. So we're, we're ready and we're able to work with our employer partners on executing whatever needs they need. Um, obviously, I want to acknowledge that manufacturing, retail, every industry is struggling to fill these jobs right now. Um, we're not immune from that. I think the trades are still viewed, though, as one of those one of those places where the American dream is alive and well, where you can come in, come out with little to no student loan debt whatsoever, um, and you can have a family supporting job and a career and a retirement and a pension. Um, so we are, I think. We are fighting that current a little bit less than some of the other industries with the fact that we're unionized. Um, but then uh, we also can't train people overnight for this. So we are looking ahead. Um, you know, like I said before, the difference between coal and nuclear is subtle. A lot of it is highly transferable, especially more of the, the physical stuff. And I think one of the reasons that we're appealing to our employer partners as well um, is we're kind of a job agency on steroids. You know, we are different than some of the other unionized uh, vocations you see in the press that are doing, making history and doing incredible things, forming new unions everywhere. But our, our employers choose to come and work with us because we apply a value um, to their job sites that they can't get elsewhere. We are able to, we have already existing freestanding training centers throughout the state. You, you can't go anywhere and not be within driving distance of a training center. Um, and we're able to put out calls to other locals if we need to fill these needs. So we're appealing to our employers in a way, and they choose to enter those collective bargaining agreements with us for that reason. They're not enticed into it. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a ton of opportunity out there. We touched on it a little bit earlier. It's exciting. The amount of work that's going to be coming down from the federal government is really hard to wrap your mind around. So we're looking at ways uh, to fill those roles. We're looking, we're expending a lot of effort into expanding the pools of people we're looking at. Women is a huge priority for the trades right now, recruiting women into the trades, recruiting people of color, going into communities that we haven't traditionally been in before and talking to people there and having a presence that hasn't been there. So um not a small challenge, but one that we're ready to meet, one that we're excited, excited to meet. Good. Good to hear. Tom, you guys are primarily focused on, on cost, of course. 
but there's a, um, you know, reliability. How do you weigh that? Because sometimes cost shouldn't be the only driving force, right? Uh, people still like to have power 24 um, seven. So sometimes the cheapest isn't always um, the best. And on a per, and now with the the help coming from the the federal government, um, you know, I think nuclear is now starting to get more on par because it was, you know, we had the the gas revolution, which really out out um, priced nuclear for a while, and I think led to some of the premature closures. You had the um, tax credits that were skewing the cost of the renewables, and then it, so nuclear was really left out of the picture. But now we're seeing more generation neutral. Um, agnostic type of tax credits coming that may help cut down some of the concerns. Are your members, are you guys starting to see that? Um, how, how, do you, how do you guys as a group balance cost versus reliability? I mean, I think, I think when, you, when it comes to energy, people want reliability. And I think the expectations of reliability have actually increased mm-hmm. as, we, as we think about powering our businesses and and also the high speed broadband for working from home or for or for for our our lives i think there is a lot of attention on cost um from our members um there's not a lot of focus on nuclear because there haven't been a lot of nuclear issues one of the issues that has come up in in recent cases is is the escalating costs that uh we energy's customers are paying for the for the power purchase agreement for Point Beach and that we've, we do hear about uh, some of our members for that um, because of the, the, the hockey stick kind of escalation that we're seeing um, in terms of the, the, the costs year over year that are increasing for nuclear power for our customers today. But then we also hear about reliability. I hear about it from my family when, we're, when, we're, when our power is out. So it is a balancing act. Um, and, and it is interesting that the that the federal the federal dollars and the federal decision to add um, you know to incentivize different technologies um, is could create an interesting scenario where we don't know what the winners are down the road. Um, but I think our concern and the concern of our members, you know, whether they're whether they're advocates for clean energy or whether they're just skeptical of the bias toward building 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 toward inter- that, that that is in. It, it is part and parcel of the monopoly structure that 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 puts high pressure on rates. So I think there 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 has to be there has to be a balancing act there, and I think that's that's something that um, we need to we need to keep in mind. I and mean, we need to look. We're talking about a lift off lift off toward commercialization because because we're not there yet. And so what will the cost of this be versus competing technologies? The energy tech energy uh, technology evolution is happening so fast. It's happening with long duration batteries at the same time that it's happening with with uh, with uh, with with nuclear. In fact, I was just looking at uh, the liftoff page on, that Cheryl mentioned on Energy.gov, and they have a liftoff page for for nuclear. They have a liftoff page for uh, hydrogen, and they have a liftoff page for long duration batteries. Um, so that's, it's, it's exciting to see that there are a lot, there's this time of great change, but you know, it just have, we, our members are, are skeptical of being, of seeing the costs, costs, um, the cost experience of being at kind of at the bleeding edge of new, of nuclear and the experience that happened in Georgia or even in Florida where customers, um, our, our counterpart agency in Florida, the consumer advocate had to go to bat for ratepayers to um, reduce the cost of the to ratepayers by over six hundred million of the costs that were were incurred just to start down the path of building the new nuclear plant, the plant that ended up being aborted. We're gonna. I'm gonna pause, Kristen, if that's okay for some questions, um, or if you have some, start you know putting them on the cards, and Kristen will pass some along as they as they come in. Um, but first I want to ask, um, we all were sitting here, you guys got any, we heard a great perspective on the state, um, perspectives, what's happening around the country, uh, what's happening at the federal level. Um, we have state policymakers here and people that influence state policymakers here. Um, is there anything in particular that Wisconsin can learn from, um, you know, we see, 
um, I think a couple of us were sharing the, the eye popping numbers coming out of California to rescue their plants that they finally realized, oh, yeah, we kind of need power 24 seven. So let's not kill Diablo too early. But their ratepayers are really going to pay for that. Um, what have you seen? What you know, any of you around the country that that was really good? Wisconsin needs to continue. We should copy that or um, red flag, stay away. Like, don't do what X state did. You got any good examples? Good policy things, tips to pass along? I guess I'll jump in there. I mean, I think it it sort of dovetails off what Tom was just saying. Um, I think that switching from, you know, we had this very strong history of renewable portfolio standards around the country that were a great technology policy move to advance wind and solar energy and, and moving those forward um, to transition those to clean energy portfolio standards, where, uh, as you were referring to, Ellen, they're technology neutral, but really focusing on the outcome of reducing carbon and other emissions. I um, mean, you know, I'm here, <clears throat> my motivation as a nuclear engineer is because I'm interested in the clean energy transition. And there's a great opportunity in Wisconsin for more renewable energy. And we're, we're really at the beginning of our transition in Wisconsin compared to some other states. And there's a great opportunity for more wind, more, more solar. But we will eventually bump up against a point where it's hard to make those expand in an economic way. And, and things like nuclear energy are needed to balance that out. And so technology neutral policies in general that are aiming towards a clean energy transition you know, I think you put those two ideas together and, and build policies around that idea, and it will support nuclear energy um, pretty well. Jeremy, you've been worked around the country. I know Wisconsin's now your favorite place. Um, what what should we uh, learn from? Who should we learn from? Well, just as far as leaders go, and there's leaders in this room, whether it's the students at the table or or others, you have you know leaders. You know they make decisions and influence behaviors. That's what good leaders do you really look back at the history of why are we spending $1.5 billion at Diablo Canyon, it goes back to leadership and making this lead, leaders making decisions based on objective evidence, leaving personal biases aside. I'm pro nuclear, obviously, but I have to sometimes step back and I have to look at the, the downsides and the affordability to something that I'm very passionate about. They made a decision several years ago to decommission that state that that plan in 2025, and on paper they had a um, a plan to replace that energy. It was never really challenged. It was challenged uh, academically by those that understood the power market and said this plan. If you really get into the details associated with it, you're going to know that the facts don't support the replacement of that energy. So as a result of that, Diablo Canyon stopped investing in the plant years ago, because it's going into decommissioning both units, why would you spend significant capital to maintain those facilities, go through the, the relicensing process, so they just stop spending money. So now they're doing an extreme catch up in today's dollars. Had they been making those incremental investments over time, understanding that their plan to replace was flawed, we wouldn't be spending $1.5 billion. So the lesson there to the folks that are making decisions is when somebody brings you a plan, if I bring you a plan to put a nuclear power plant, small modular reactor in the state of Wisconsin, I expect you to challenge me. I challenge my assumptions, challenge my economics, challenge my safety. I expect that. If somebody brings you a plan to take a coal plant offline or one of the nuclear stations, challenge the replacement objectively. Leave your biases aside, challenge objectively and make a good decision as a leader should. Well, I think they'll be challenged. <laughs> I don't think you'll have a problem with that. I'm not going to have any problems. No, no, no. I think you'll, uh, you'll hear from folks. But uh, we did have a question, and I want to clarify a couple of questions related to cost. Because we, um, and this, is, again, is pre-tax credits and all that good stuff. Um, when given an average size range for the small modular, um, what are we talking about in megawatts? And then... Is it because it's smaller, is it going to be more per megawatt hour um, than, you know, let's say the 1100 megawatts that they're building at Vogel 3 um, on a per megawatt? Is that going to increase? And then com how does that compare to natural gas, wind, you know, the, on the construction side? Um, so small modular reactors, you know, would probably be in the range of um, you know, a few hundred megawatts, you know, 
in the range of a few hundred megawatts, two to 500 megawatts or something like that would be in the small modular reactor range. Um, it's hard to talk about cost because we've never built a small modular reactor yet. So we don't actually know what they're going to cost. Um, when we look at the way, when we do a sort of an engineering cost analysis of how these things scale, um, you know, most, most of the estimates have suggested that per megawatt hour, a very well-built small modular reactor might be a little bit more expensive than a very well-built, very large um, reactor. Certainly the first ones would be. Um, one of the real opportunities, though, is the opportunity of learning by doing it many times. We have 92 operating reactors in this country. We've built 120 or so ever in this country over 50 years. There's not a lot of opportunity to really learn by doing when you've had a dozen different companies, each maybe building a few reactors each. If we get to a place where with an order book of, of 10 plus, maybe 20 reactors, then a company can build one, learn from it, build the next one, and there's a much better opportunity of learning by doing. And we see in other energy technologies, particularly when they're smaller energy technologies, that is a huge impact. One of my colleagues here at UW studied this for solar energy. And one of the major drivers um, to solar energy getting so much cheaper is we've just done so much of it. Every solar panel you build, you get to learn and do the next one better. And so, um, so it's, I can't quote you a number. Um, you know, the natural gas is rising and falling. I don't think we should build nuclear power plants if they're not economically favorable. Um, but, it's, uh, but a small modular reactor is the first one. As I say, a well-built one might be slightly more expensive than a well-built large whitewater reactor. But we can expect there to be an opportunity for that to go down as we do more of it. Okay. Jeremy? Yeah, just a little bit more background on where dairy land is in our process. Um, this year, our objective is to do what's called a site study, and uh, we're going to spend a lot of money to do that with the consortium of companies that are working with us. So we're studying sites, and that's really critical when you start talking about the cost per megawatt. You, your, your objective there is to find a place that is the most economically viable and safe to build the facility. There's a lot of things that goes into the construction of one of these facilities. If you select the wrong place, you can be talking a lot more cost. So you got the CapEx cost on the front end. What's it cost to build? Selecting the right site and selecting the right amount of energy 10 years down the road. You don't want to put this where you're going to have to build transmission out to go to uh, longer places. So the load has to be there so you can get the scale you need to keep the cost per megawatt. So this siting study that we're doing this year is very uh, it has a very rigorous process attached to it to make sure that we're making the best decision based on facts. Your going forward operating cost is still a little bit of a question as to what is it actually going to cost to operate after your capital investment is done. And I say that because there's a lot going on in fuel development and fuel uh, research. The fuel's getting better. For example, when you go to fill your, your gas tank up back in the 70s, you had lead in there and now it's this high 93 octane stuff. You know, there's a there's a whole lot going into fuel that's going to make that economic picture a little different. If you continue to reduce your base load, as Paul stated, there's a lot of volatility in natural gas that's taking over the energy that coal is displacing. So if you think that today's price without nuclear for electricity is going to be constant, I think you're fooling yourself. If, if the volume of natural gas usage continues to rise, the cost of electricity is going to continue to rise. So we're trying to balance that future. But right now in our process, it's about finding a safe, safe place, a reliable technology that matches to that place. And then we're going to really start looking at the CapEx and the moving forward operating costs to make sure that it fits the model. I'm going to push you a little more. What's that ideal place where it has transmission ready, but what else are you guys looking for in this site study? So, so big picture, I think it was mentioned earlier. Um, there is a report that came out in September that talks about uh, coal plants being transferred, yeah. trans, yeah. Uh, transformed into a nuclear. So it's a coal to nuclear report. If you look at it, every coal site in the United States was studied and it boiled it down to you know, here's the optimal sites. Uh, it, was, it was funded by the federal government. There's actually five sites in the uh, state of Wisconsin that were studied, and there's actually one that is we would rise to the top of the list. And I'm not at liberty to discuss exactly which site that might be, and I don't want to start that conversation. But that's one piece of the puzzle that we're looking at is coal to nuclear. The other is retired 
or existing nuclear facilities. You have a Kiwani station, and the reason you're looking at that, they've already been licensed seismically flooding. All these other criteria have been met, and they have the transmission because these sites were generating that amount of electricity at one point, and there was a load out there for it to serve. So these really start coming to the top of the list as far as where we would actually consider putting that. But we also have to look at the future. And what is 10 years from now low growth look like in these in these regions? So I know that's a vague answer, but that's a, as good as I can do for you right now. Okay. So you're not going to reveal any sites? <clears throat> I, I am not going to okay. talk about cities. <laughs> towns, towns, counties, <laughs> voting districts. So we got a couple other questions. I'm going to combine a couple again. Um, with the carbon reduction goals, um, whether it's zero, net zero, you know, is one, is nuclear the only, going to be the only base load power that's going to, is that going to be our only option going forward? And then two, is it realistic then to have, a nuclear option to help us achieve whatever the goal is, if it's 2040, 2050. I mean, I always talk about there's the rhetoric, but then there's reality. So can we match this up? Are we going to be able to see some nuclear yeah. carbon free baseload? Yes. The, the short answer is yes, but I, I believe in diversity. You have to have wind, you have to have solar you have to have hydro pump storage. There's a lot of those things that you have to continue to pursue, but you can't put all your eggs in one basket. You have to have a diverse portfolio, no different than your investment portfolio. Some days this is doing good. Some days it's not doing so good, but as long as you have the right energy mix, you're going to be okay. So one of the transitions, you know, nuclear's got to be a piece of this, in my opinion, and I think we can do this in a safe, reliable, and affordable manner. But the other thing that you have to consider is our gas, our gas facilities, for example, the one that's at Rock Gen over here, the Intech facility that Dairyland is talking about building, is these plants burn natural gas today, but they are hydrogen ready in the future. The problem with hydrogen today is we don't have a ready fuel source like we have natural gas. But if you started plumbing hydrogen to Rock Gen, I'll burn it today because I can burn it today. Those plants are built to do that. Intech. So as we transition in an orderly fashion into a carbon-free world, having a nice mix of maybe gas as it's transitioning over to hydrogen burn as we learn how to create hydrogen, and there's ways that you can take nuclear energy and create hydrogen. So there's a lot of interconnectivity, but you don't want to put all your eggs in the natural gas hydrogen business or in the nuclear business or in the renewable. If we can keep a nice mix of a portfolio, and that's really the vision of Dairyland. We're small. But we're a micro of a macro system. We have probably time for one more question. Okay. Wouldn't waste reduction be another advantage for from advanced reactors? Yeah, that, that sounds like a Paul <laughs> question. Um, right. So one of the other characteristics of advanced reactors that some companies are pursuing is uh, changing the nuclear fuel cycle, as we call it. Right now, we mine uranium out of the ground. We enrich it to put it into our reactors. We, it spends four and a half, five years in a reactor, and then we store it. And the, the current plan for most of that used fuel is to put it in an underground repository forever. Um, since the beginning of the nuclear age, we have known how to do other things with our used nuclear fuel. The very first electricity generated by nuclear power was by a reactor that was breeding its fuel and able to get involved in a whole recycling mode, where the fuel that comes out of the reactor can be chemically manipulated and, and changed and separated into different pieces, some of that would then go back into another kind of reactor, and we keep generating electricity in a true recycling mode. Um, there's a, you know, it's, it would be a whole other lecture to talk about the pros and cons of all those different technologies and why we haven't done it yet and when we might do it. France does do this to some extent. They do sort of a single recycle pass of their material. Um, it would, it is expected to result in about a factor of two reduction in the amount of waste they need to put underground when they're done. We know of technologies that could bring that to a factor of 100 reduction, but um, there's a whole bunch of you know, R&D questions still and cost questions of whether it's the most cost-effective way to do that in this country right now and when it will be cost-effective. So. Great. Well, we're at the end of our time. Um, I, I got to tell you, I feel good about we've got just a great panel of experts here. We know we've got the people here in Wisconsin. 
Thank you, Ellen. And to the panel, what a great discussion. A lot of, again, food for thought and just feel like Wisconsin is really well positioned and the perspectives from a from a consumer to the labor and the workforce to an industry that is exploring it and to the research and development and to the, the, the next generation. So thank you very much for that great discussion. And Ellen, thank you for your, your moderating and uh, just that ease of, of questions as we went through things. Well, we are coming to the end of our customer's first breakfast. If we stay around here any longer, it's going to be called the Power Lunch. Uh, so I want to thank the uh, speakers who joined us this morning. Thank you very much, Christine and Cheryl. Thank you to the legislators for that legislative perspective earlier today. I know during the break, uh, I saw another representative who came and joined us and want to just recognize, I don't know if he is still here, Representative Moore Omakunde joined us and serves on the Utility Committee in the Assembly uh, want to thank our, um, our, our speakers, the panelists, the sponsors. Thank you very much to the sponsors who made today possible. Uh, to customers first and the board for um, supporting this idea of the theme of uh, nuclear discussion today. Thank you to customers first for leading on this topic. And to our fearless leader, Kristen Jilks, thank you very much for all of your hard work in getting today set up. Let's have an applause for, for Kristen in, in arranging... Uh, the speakers and just the great flow of information and just a great perspective from today. So we started out this breakfast by asking a, a few questions. The first one was, where does nuclear power fit into Wisconsin's current and future energy mix, generation mix? And Senator Agard shared with us more about the state of nuclear and Christine provided a handout that detailed nuclear energy providing 16% of Wisconsin's energy needs and 68% of our current carbon-free generation. Our industry panel shared thoughts on the future of nuclear with Darylin's exploration of new and sm new small modular reactors. And we asked the question about are state policy changes needed in light of new technologies such as small modular reactors and energy fusion breakthroughs? Representative Peterson shared information about the 2015 Wisconsin Act 344, which lifted Wisconsin's nuclear moratorium and changed uh, its place in Wisconsin's Energy Priorities Act. A copy of the Legislative Council memo explaining that law is included in your folders, and Christine shared thoughts on action states can take that address nuclear power issues. Cheryl told us about the new initiative between the National Association of State Energy Offices and the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners that will help states, including Wisconsin, collaborate on best practices while addressing these emerging issues. And finally, the question is, is nuclear power good for Wisconsin electric consumers? Tom Content helped us understand how the state's consumer advocate weighs the economics of new power generation. And Cheryl helped us understand some of the federal incentives that are impacting the cost-benefit balance of nuclear generation. And overall, I hope you, have, you leave with the sense that many different perspectives can come up from very different uh, considerations on what's best for our state. This is a dialogue that will continue in years ahead, and we're thankful to have shared some of that food for thought to keep the conversation going. So thank you very much. This concludes our breakfast. And again, it does not, it, this is just the beginning of this ongoing conversation with policymakers and industry leaders and education and workforce in Wisconsin. Thank you very much. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civic broadcast network, providing gavel to gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol. Thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in. Please support our work. You can subscribe to the Electric Wire podcast if you haven't already, and you can follow us on Twitter at The Electric Wire. Thanks also to the members of the Customers First Coalition for supporting this podcast. Our members are Dairyland Power Cooperative, Madison Gas and Electric, the Municipal Electric Utilities of Wisconsin, WPPI Energy, the Citizens Utility Board, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 2150, and the Wisconsin Electric Cooperatives Association. Thanks again for listening. We'll have a new episode next month.